Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ANU China Seminar Series, which is supported by the Australian Centre on China and the World. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sharon Strange. I'm the Centre Manager at the Australian Centre on China and the World. I am currently deputising for our Centre's Director, who is teaching this afternoon. Welcome to those of you in the room and to those of you online as well. Um, it is a great pleasure today to be introducing Marcella Shabovic, who is a current visiting fellow at our centre. Marcella is an associate professor in Dyson College of Arts and Sciences at Pace University in New York. Her, her research interests are focused on contemporary Chinese media and youth culture, digital leisure culture, digital games, and media moral panics. Today, Marcella will be speaking about the Chinese video game industry, the world's biggest market. Her talk will examine the question, can Chinese games be fun? Uh, interrogating dominant discourse about digital games and gameplay in China. Please join me in welcoming Marcella to the lecture. Hello, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone at the center, um, Benjamin Hillman and Graham Smith for the invitation to be a visiting fellow here, and to all the staff, uh, Sharon, Nathan, Melody, uh, Nancy, for all of your assistance uh, with my trip and your kind support since I've arrived. Um, and apologies in advance for being masked today. I had a recent bout with COVID and um, though I'm recovered, I just wanna take some extra precautions. So um, today's talk is uh, based on a forthcoming chapter in the Oxford uh, Handbook of Chinese Digital Media. And um, before I begin, I just wanna say a few words about how I came to this topic. Um, so my book, uh, mapping Digital Game Culture in China from Internet Addicts to Esports Athletes was based on uh, fieldwork, ethnographic fieldwork I did with college age gamers and esports athletes in Shanghai. Um, I conducted this over the course of nearly a decade in the 2010s. And the book really focused on the ways in which the stigma surrounding internet addiction uh, shaped understandings of digital games and the experience of playing games in the Chinese context. And looking back on my <clears throat> book and on other book length uh, works on Chinese digital gaming, and um, there are a lot, in fact, coming out right now. I know of four volumes to be released, uh, three in the US and one in China within the next year uh, that will focus on Chinese uh, digital games. Uh, when I looked over this body of research and my own research, it struck me that there was a term that was largely absent. And that term and that word is, of course, what lies between the extremes of addiction and athleticism, and that is fun. Um, and this is certainly a paradox because with over 701.8 million Chinese people playing digital games, certainly there is something fun about them. Uh, instead, however, journalists and scholars alike tend to highlight China's fraught relationship with video games. They are seen on one hand as a source of revenue and soft power, and on the other hand, they are derided as a harmful form of spiritual opium. Um, the regulatory and media response to games has been referred to as a moral panic by more than one scholar, myself included, and attempts to curb video game addiction have resulted in a poorly regulated cottage industry of internet addiction boot camps. And in an effort to nip the problem in the bud, in the fall of 2021, the National Press and Publication Administration restricted underage gamers to three hours of gameplay per week, and specifically one hour per day uh, between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m. on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. In response to this announcement, an international news headline proclaimed, quote, playtime's over for China's young video gamers, end quote. And indeed, by the end of 2022, uh, just over a year after the new regulations took hold, um, Nico Partners uh, re recorded that 39 million youth gamers have reportedly stopped playing online games altogether in China. So regulations like this three-hour rule place very real limitations on young gamers' ability to have fun with video games. In such a strict regulatory environment, the capacity for fun seems to be greatly diminished. 
However, we should not let this recent development obscure a more troublesome truth. For the fact of the matter is that young gamers in China, at least as they have been symbolically constructed within dominant discourse, have never been permitted the possibility of fun with games. So in today's talk, I'm going to take as my starting point the discursive construction of Chinese digital games and gamers via an analysis of both English and Chinese language media reports and academic discussions. I'll focus a lot on English language news reports today, um, though in my own book, I actually probed uh, many of the Chinese news reports surrounding internet gaming addiction. Um, and so I refer you to that if you want a little bit more on the Chinese language media sources. So I want to first examine how dominant portrayals of both the Chinese gaming industry and Chinese gamers serve to perpetuate this Orientalist myth that Chinese games and gamers are incapable of fun. And I then am going to turn my attention to the question of why there's so little academic discussion of fun in English and Chinese language game studies and how we might meaningfully conceptualize fun. And I'm going to conclude by considering what a reimagining of the fun of video games in the Chinese context might, might accomplish. So when thinking back to my early field work on digital gaming in China, I often recall the words of one of my interlocutors, Chinese games are bu hao wan or no fun. It was 2010 and the young man who said this, a Tongji University student, was explaining why he preferred American games like Blizzard's World of Warcraft over Chinese ones. And according to him, Chinese games focus too heavily on historical and cultural narratives at the expense of gameplay. And he cited the example of the Chinese multiplayer online role-playing game, Fantasy Westward Journey, Meng Huan Xiao. And the game's story and characters, they're based on the classic text, Journey to the West. Uh, but gameplay itself, he said, consisted of repetitive and monotonous tasks that he deemed boring. So in an overview of the history of the Chinese game industry, scholar Dong Jian draws a similar conclusion. According to Dong, Chinese games industry has promoted, quote, China image games, end quote, to, quote, cover up the weaknesses in the gameplay of domestic games, end quote. And when Chinese games have been well received abroad, uh, critics have been quick to mark them as exceptions and discount the genuine nature of their success. In an all too familiar frame, refrain about Chinese innovation, an opinion, opinion piece on the blog Tech in Asia sweepingly argues that Chinese games lack originality, remarking that, quote, an extremely popular formula for Chinese game developers is to take a hot game genre internationally and create a Chinese version, end quote. One notable example of this point of criticism has been the hit mobile game Genshin Impact, Yuan Shen, uh, designed by Shanghai Bates uh, Mihoyo. And Genshin Impact is a worldwide blockbuster on the Naya Blade. It's described as the quote, biggest ever global launch for a Chinese game, end quote. And yet it is subject to scrutiny for being a clone of the hit game, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. In an article about the Chinese game success abroad, New York Times journalists Ben Dooley and Paul Moser call Genshin a nearly picture-perfect reproduction of Japanese fantasy role-playing games. And note that while China has achieved technical mastery, it still faces significant creative shortcomings. Genshin may be fun, but it is not in Dooley and Mozart's view truly creative. Rather, Chinese developers have made a fun game only by virtue of their robot-like ability to copy the Japanese, their more supposedly fun-loving and creative Asian counterpart. The perception that China has beat Japan at its own video game is a perfect example of the newest strain of techno-Orientalism, in that, as David Rowe, Betsy Huang, and Greta Nyo have argued, Japan creates the technology, but China is the technology. Games researcher Jing Sun argues that it's not a lack of originality, but rather a profit motive that holds back the development of quality Chinese games. Chinese developers have pursued a free-to-play model um, basing profit on in-game purchases rather than a subscription model that requires gamers to pay for games upfront. 
Referring to games such as these as pay to win, Matthew Chu notes that such a model is counterintuitive, asking, quote, would anyone consider pay to win chess a fun or good game, end quote. He uses the commercial success of the Chinese game Zhengtu uh, online as an example uh, and suggests that the Chinese game developers operationalize the pay to win design through the use of the gambling mechanism, such as the treasure chest, also known as the gacha system, whereby gamers pay for the chance to win rare items an approach to deems only quote unquote relatively fun. Such game design is interpreted as quote commercially innovative, but not culturally creative, end quote. Here, we may once again turn to the recent success of Genshin Impact to interrogate this claim. On the one hand, the success of Genshin, which relies on a gacha system to advance players in the game, suggests that Western players have actually not shunned monetization systems in the way that Chu suggests. Yet critics continue to argue that these pay-to-win games ultimately undermine the fun of the game experience. For example, Forbes game critic Paul Tassi argues that Genshin Impact could have been even better than Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild were it not for its, quote, relentless focus on monetization, end quote. He states, of course, the goal of any game is to make money. And Genshin being so heavily monetized has paid off in spades, as the game is one of the most profitable in the world this year. And yet in terms of what it costs the game as a game, that's where the problem lies. And it's maddening to imagine what Genshin Impact could be without these oppressive systems in place. Though China is not directly mentioned here, it takes no stretch of the imagination to infer that the oppressive systems plaguing Genshin impact in Tassie's view are not only its monetization technique, but also the Chinese system itself. So these statements and queries demonstrate that Chinese game developers have yet to persuade others, either within China or globally, to view themselves, uh, to view them as designers of quality games. And if Chinese games do succeed commercially, it is presumed that they do so only by copycatting foreign titles. So here, one cannot help but draw parallels to the perception that China is the world's tech factory. As Apple products so bluntly tell consumers, the iPhone is designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. Games, we are led to believe, are played in China, but are successfully designed elsewhere. So while issues surrounding Chinese video games and their perception would seem to be contemporary, scholar Tara Fickle, this is a great book by the way, which I highly recommend, uh, has demonstrated that China's relationships to games has always been distorted in the eyes of the West. Fickle's critical analysis of the work of game studies foundational theorists, Johan Huizinga and Roger Kalwa, unearths long-held tropes about the nature of Chinese gameplay and gamers. In building his classic argument for the universality of play across cultures, Huizinga argues that in China, competition or agon is a central part of life. By way of example, he discusses the Chinese emphasis on civility, for example, battles over who should pay a check at a restaurant. As Fickle is quick to point out, Huizinga later aligns such forms of competitive play with a sort of pluralism. And in Fickle's interpretation, Huizinga's analysis thus re reveals Chinese people's lack of quote unquote true playfulness. They are too serious to allow anything to be just a game. As she bitingly summarizes, this culminates in the Western perception that China is characterized by a quote, centuries long tradition of fun sucking hyper competitive and hyper competitiveness rather, end quote. She goes on to discuss the other founding theorist of game studies, uh, Roger Kalwa, uh, and talks about how he focuses on a typology of play drawing binary distinct distinctions between competition and chance, a system of classification that rests upon the agency or lack thereof of the player. Kalwa refers to the Chinese zodiac as a representation of China's orientation towards circular time and suggests that the Chinese worldview is linked to Elea 
or a reliance on auspiciousness. This is contrast with rectilinear time or a rational orientation toward time as forward progress. Thus, in Kalawala's interpretation, we're left with a vision of Chinese play in which the gamer is too resigned to fate to be capable of claiming agency over their actions. So when surveying the state of English language discourses about gaming in China, um, what Tara Fickle calls ludo-orientalism here has left its mark. English language journalism and scholarship about digital gaming in China has tended to focus on two issues, work and addiction. In both cases, one finds numerous stories of gamers who play, whose play is, as scholar Hannah Wehrman has argued, extreme and different. The issue of productive play is not a new one in game studies. In fact, it's long been a focus of game study scholars. In exploring the labor of fun, uh, Nick Yi argues that video games are inherently work platforms that train us to become better game workers. In the Chinese context, however, games entanglement with work becomes a means yet again through which the trope of China as the world's factory is reinforced. At the forefront of this narrative about labor uh, is the figure of the Chinese gold farmer. As connoted by the label farmer, such individuals are depicted as, as Tai and Hu have said, quote, low wage, low tech, and low culture, low brows, end quote. In his key review of um, social issues associated with online games in China, Matthew M. Chu argues somewhat hyperbolically that gold farming is in fact the only well-studied social aspect of Chinese online games. Despite this, the fact that gold farmers are really skilled professionals who are highly adept at the games they play is largely overlooked. Um, instead, as downtrodden laborers, it is assumed that gold farmers are not afforded the privilege of having fun within the game that they play for their work. So this depiction of Chinese gamers as menial laborers carries over to the realm of esports and entertainment. So in recent years, it's no secret that Chinese esports athletes have distinguished themselves as some of the top competitive gamers in the world. But despite this, their skill as players is often undermined by an emphasis on their punishing practice routines. Take, for example, a journalistic account of esports athletes who practice 14 hours a day, seven days a week, with many remaining at their computers until 4 a.m. The authors describe how these, quote, grim faced, end quote, and serious players operate with the understanding that they are replaceable. They even have doctors and physiotherapists responsible for, quote, taking them out for at least one walk a day for exercise. So this description, as outrageous as it is, is clearly more befitting of caged animals than highly skilled celebrity athletes. Now, beyond this focus on labor, another prevalent theme in studies of Chinese games is that of game addiction. China is known, of course, for being one of the first countries to publish clinical standards for internet addiction. And it's the subject of much fascination in this regard. As scholars Cho and Kim have convincingly argued, the English language press often highlights the phenomenon of Asian gamer death. And in such portrayals, East Asian countries are conflated and interchangeable. South Korea, China, Taiwan all make regular appearances only to be reduced to yet another example of the other. The story of internet addiction in Asia in this sense functions to allay Western fears about the potential dystopian consequences of our obsession with digital products. English language media outlets seem determined to emphasize the agentic differences between East and West. Cho and Kim point to the example of a Sony PlayStation television commercial that celebrates a young white man who, quote, never stops playing, end quote, and a UK media headline that highlights, on the other hand, the story of a Taiwanese man who dies while playing games in an internet cafe. Cho and Kim observe that, quote, for the young, healthy white male, gaming without end is made into something desirable. 
The death of the Taiwanese gamer, on the other hand, invokes anxiety, highlighting not the fun of gaming without end, but the deleterious effects and fatal consequences of prolonged physical inactivity, end quote. And when Chinese men are not in the press dying as a result of their obsession with video games, uh, the press likes to highlight how they are emasculated um, by them. These depictions reproduce the common Orientalist stereotype of the Asian man as physically impotent. Consider here a Newsweek article about a man who became paralyzed from the waist down while playing video games. Or a Los Angeles Times article that recounts the strange journey of a young Chinese man who turned to pole dancing uh, to cure himself of internet gaming addiction. Now, this is a seemingly redemptive story of personal discovery. Um, and yet uh, the Times article nonetheless per perpetuates stereotypes about the effeminate Asian man by highlighting an activity that it's marked in the West as having to do with female sexuality. Now, in Mandarin, if we turn to um, terms that are popular in Chinese, um, the, there are plenty of slang terms that also sort of stress the physical harm of playing games for long hours. One of the terms used to discuss gaming, of course, is pao, as in pao wang ba, or to steep, as one might steep a tea bag in hot water. Um, and this phrase was frequently used to describe how young people um, would steep in the internet cafe when playing games for long hours. A more recent slang term in Mandarin is gan, as in gan yu xi. Gan is a noun meaning liver, but in this context, the word is a verb akin to the English language slang term for grinding. Um, grinding is referring to a monotonous task that must be completed in order to advance in a game. And this Chinese term uh, evokes the vision of a gamer who spends hours grinding away at a difficult game, exhausting themselves to the point of bodily harm. What's interesting here, of course, is that both uh, pao and gan emphasize excess. While the verb pao stresses the extreme passivity of the internet game addict who plays games in the internet cafe, the concept of gan, on the other hand, highlights the extreme effort of the gamer whose play has become a kind of compulsion. Um, so having done this review, I now wanna turn my uh, attention to the question of what fun means in the context of gaming. And as I mentioned before, uh, this is a question that's often been surprisingly avoided by game scholars. So in one respect, I think that the circumnavigation of fun in game studies may be understood as this byproduct of the inability to capture the spontaneous essence of fun without dismantling it. If fun lifts effervescently from impromptu interactions that occur within games, then our attempt to clumsily reconstitute it by distilling it to some sort of shit shelf stable concentrate leaves us with something that is decidedly unfun. And this, in fact, is a problem of internet studies as a whole, um, as I have argued in my book, in that we're constantly chasing this ever evolving web of meaning and affect. So to describe why something is fun is to undo the necessary spontaneity of it and to try to freeze something that exists only in relation to a specific context and a specific temporality of interaction. Um, as Chinese trolls might say of some of their playful memes and banter, uh, or like if you take it too seriously, you lose, right? You can't take something seriously without dismantling the joy and fun of it. Um, put it uh, to put it in more scholarly terms, Johann Huizenga declared at the outset of his seminal work on play that the fun of playing, quote, resists all analysis, all logical interpretation, end quote. Game scholar Jesper Jewell similarly points out that the fun of games is variable since, quote, there is ultimately no one sentence description of what makes all games fun. Different games emphasize different types of enjoyment and different players may even enjoy the same game for entirely different reasons, end quote. So given this subjective nature of fun, why should we bother with the concept? Well, on one 
uh, sort of important point here is that discussions of the variable interpretations of what makes games fun or enjoyable necessarily shifts our focus from the ludic and narrative elements of the game itself to a focus on the agency of the players. For example, game scholars in the past have used this player perspective to combat technologically determinist arguments about the causal effects of violent video games on aggression. Here, um, we can conceive of the fun of a game as an affordance that arises through the interactions between the medium and the players who use it. Now, affordances are a core concept employed within the field of human-computer interaction. Um, they are useful for technology designers and scholars alike, as they help us to navigate this interactive nature of user experience. And Beijing Normal University game scholar uh, Liu Mengfei argues that the design of the game itself must permit the possibility or the xing of fun. Um, but fun is not a given, right? Uh, fun has to be realized through the agency of the gamer who plays the game in such a way as to create a desired outcome. And this alone is a important corrective to depictions of Chinese gamers as zombified game addicts who sit passively playing games to the point of physical death. Beyond the interactive nature of fun, a review of prominent academic discussions of the fun of games gives rise to a number of different possibilities, which for simplicity's sake here, I'm going to refer to as productive fun, transgressive fun, and unproductive fun. So to take the, the first uh, element here, productive fun, uh, fun in games, according to theorist Jesper Jewell, should not be mistaken for freedom from constraint. Right. In fact, if a game did not have rules, it would be no fun at all. Right. Who can play or win a game with no rules? So the fun of games then is not about a lack of rules, but rather about the substitution of an imaginary set of rules in place of the rules of real life. Of course, the rules of the game are intended to be easier to master than the rules of real life. And hence, game designers like Rafe Koster argue that, quote, Fun from games arises out of mastery. It arises out of comprehension. It's the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun. In other words, with games, learning is the drug, end quote. Fun in these depictions is the result of playing by the rules. Like other fundamental concepts such as happiness, fun is also then hampered by judgments about what true or pure fun should look like. What does it mean to have good, clean fun? Now, though digital games are frequently portrayed as a kind of guilty pleasure or a dangerous form of fun, the truth of the matter is that there are plenty of games purists out there who insist that one must play by the rules in order to enjoy the fun of games. Um, by way of example, consider the anthropological account of World of Warcraft in China written by Bonnie Nardi, who observes that gameplay without cheat codes and mods is more organic and fun. To illustrate her point, she offers up her own experience with mods and says, I would not trade the fun of having gained command of the lava walls for quick, quicker progress in the game. So in other words, sort of deriding those who might cheat at the game. Um, similarly, uh, game scholar Leo Mengfei argues that quote unquote genuine gamers uh, take advantage of the affordances of games to manipulate their environment. Um, as she says here, uh, genuine gamers enter a game world and ask, what can I do? How can I transform this world? Both Nardi and Leo emphasize the pleasures of player agency, the experience of fun, right? Emerging from this process of figuring out how to do things within the stimulate, simulated space of the game. And this concept of fun as mastery has a long history in China, right? So if we go all the way back um, to the origins of the traditional Chinese board game Go, Wei Ti, um, Mark Moskowitz notes that the game was linked to enlightenment and seen as a practice that could discipline the player. Li Na cites Confu Confucius and links fun to a process of learning, 
noting, quote, Confucianism values happy learning, uh, adopting rituals and music to shape the moral outlook of individuals. Knowing something is inferior to liking it, liking it is inferior to playing it, as the saying goes, end quote. So in all of these interpretations, fun is about adopting the proper disposition towards games as learning, fun as mastery. Um, the player's interaction with the game is neither too passive nor too active, but as with Goldilocks, just right. These terms now are set forth um, not by the gamers themselves, but rather by the game designers who create the rules by which the game must be played. And then gamers, in interacting appropriately within the sandbox of the game, claim agency over the game in the sense of doing something with and to them. But at the same time, they have to be careful that their actions are not so overdetermined as to become cheating and or work. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, of course, we can look to the aforementioned examples of Chinese gold farmers and esports athletes as types of gamers who have mastered the game they play, but because of their mastery is because they don't value mastery as an end in itself, they're seen as having corrupted the fun of games, right? Um, so in this sense, um, proper fun must also be looked at as an experience best enjoyed by the privileged. Gamers must expend the right amount of energy and the time necessary to engage in societally acceptable fun activities, while approaching fun with the proper disposition as neither work nor obsession. And um, this is something that I also saw quite clearly in the narratives of college student gamers in Shanghai in my fieldwork that I discuss at length in my book, in the sense that when they talked about their interactions with games and playing games, they talked about how they were able to adopt a disposition, a proper disposition towards game at skill building, right? Games as a form of competition. Um, but, uh, you know, we have to think about who is afforded the ability to play in the right way. And these idealistic notions of organic or pure fun, um, in fact, can highlight for us the inequities of participatory media. Um, as Lisa Nakamura has argued, individuals have differing access to digital agency. Um, so digital media such as video games in this sense are often portrayed as a social equalizer, when in fact the very capacity to engage with games in a socially sanctioned way is out of reach of many individuals. Now, <clears throat> moving on, it's clear that people do not always play games the way they are intended to be played, right? And for many gamers, fun is not about um, playing by the rules, but rather playing with or even against the rules. And this sort of fun, in other words, is transgressive. And in keeping with the tradition of critical cultural studies, much of the English language scholarship on the Chinese internet valorizes this sort of transgressive fun. And it's really interesting to consider, for example, and I'm going to um, veer away from games for a moment, that a dominant paradigm of Chinese internet studies, at least English language-based Chinese internet studies, is that of playfulness. In what's now regarded as one of the seminal works on Chinese internet culture, scholar Guo Bin Yang has argued that, quote, play has a spirit of irreverence. It always sits uncomfortably with power. Much Chinese internet culture in general is enlivened with the spirit, the spirit of play. Um, from memes to discussion boards, right, scholars have mapped uh, in English the myriad ways in which participatory culture of the internet gives rise to creative banter that pokes fun at the rigidity of the establishment. And in this context, the playfulness of the so-called Chinese netizen is closely aligned with transgression and the idea that internet users are finding creative ways to bend the rules. These scholars stress the agency of these creators, these internet creators, to manipulate everyday language. You know, uh, the, the famous Tony Ma comes to mind, right, to highlight hidden meanings and evade censorship. Um, and the application of concepts such as Bakhtin's carnivalesque establish the Chinese language internet as this kind of raucous and hedonistic sphere in which hierarchies are inverted, if only temporarily. 
Now, video games, to take up games again, are by definition intended for play, and yet they're paradoxically excluded from most discussions of the playfulness of the Chinese language internet. Um, so why is this the case? Well, of course, the very fact that play in games is engineered frequently by corporations seeking profit seems to sap play of its transgressive potential. So rather than using play to break or bend the rules, video game play requires one to submit to the rules as we've just discussed. And under such circumstances, play transforms from something creative and spontaneous into a tool of dominant ideology. It becomes a trap that gives the illusion of agency while in fact subjugating its players more completely to the system. Gaming, as uh, Nick Dyer Whiteford and Greg Deputer have argued, quote, makes becoming a neoliberal subject fun, end quote. Those who play games are thus exempt from scholarly discussions of playfulness because they are fundamentally perceived as being played by the gaming industry. To find games fun according to the terms set by game designers, gamers have to accept the norms on which um, the rules are predicated. Now, pointing out that many games in the West, that is, um, and, and supposedly within China, though, she, though her focus is the West, she points out that many games reinforce a heteronorm, heteronormative worldview. Bonnie Ruberg has asked and channeled Sara Ahmed in asking, quote, what oppression does the promise of fun enact? Um, researchers and gamers alike, myself included, um, have not wanted to consider this question very much. We've found ourselves enthralled by the idea that games represent an escape from, or an, at least an alternative to reality. Um, those who are unable to find success in real life look to the possibility of success in the game. And in my book, I've even described games in China as a form of sideways mobility, whereby gamers are able to challenge the normative expectations of what it means to grow up in contemporary urban China. If, however, the escape offered by games is reduced to false consciousness, then playing the game is not transgressive, but rather a form of what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism. To this end, Lisa Nakamura has argued that games provide, quote, that elusive and satisfying feeling of having earned privilege, of engaging in a meritocracy that works the way that it should, end quote. She goes on to note that this fantasy is particularly harmful for those who are actually disadvantaged in real life and are thus fooled into thinking that games are a viable alternative. Scholars Lin and Zhao draw a similar attention to the cruel optimism of the Chinese esports industry, noting that esports players in China have been captured by this myth of meritocracy, something they say is, quote, a false consciousness misleading them into voluntary suffering through precarity and disposability. So the truth of the matter is um, that to push back on this a little bit, as the games industry has developed over the course of the last few decades, this myth of meritocracy has been increasingly shattered, right? As pay-to-win games um, highlighted in an introduction demonstrate, gamers now often require either money or a tireless commitment to performing redundant and boring tasks in order to advance within the game. And even those gamers who do earn their qualifications in a game often find their online pursuits frustrated by the proliferation of Paywan or gaming companions, who are these for hire professional gamers who help wealthy gamers achieve their goals in the game without expenditure of time or effort. Video games, like other media before them, are, of course, colonized by the inequities of capitalism. Under such circumstances, I would ask, are we to believe that gamers are still so naive that they are duped by this myth of meritocracy in games? Is it not possible that gamers know that the playing field they're entering in, into is uneven and yet still find the game environment more fun than real life? Indeed, young gamers have rarely been credited um, with understanding, let alone challenging, the dominant ideology of the games that they play. 
It's telling, for example, that in a forthcoming volume on games and play in China, um, there is an entire section devoted to what they call player agency and circumventing the rules, which is exactly what I'm talking about here, right? Yet the only example of transgressive play in video games comes by way of a septuagenarian Pokemon Go player in Taiwan who rejects the game's focus on accumulation and leveling up in order to pursue the pure enjoyment of capturing monsters. Another article from the same volume focuses on the way in which young Chinese game addicts in a rehabilitation camp manage to, in the absence of video games, gamify the experience of the camp. Now, it's notable here that the gamer's playfulness yet again occurs outside the space of the video game. Pleasure is found in the ability of the youngsters to subvert the rules of the camp by turning what is intended to be serious into a fun game. Now, <clears throat> to go back to Bonnie Ruberg, um, in suggesting that uh, many of the mass-produced games are no fun for marginalized or queer communities, she seeks to highlight a, quote, clearer range of emotions, end quote, engendered by playing games. And this has been going on in China as well. Chinese indie game designers have similarly been toying with negative affect in games, right? Games that are no fun. Um, simulation games frequently engage gamers in these imaginative scenarios that mimic real life. Take, for example, um, the popular game, Chinese Parents, Zhongguo uh, Shi Jiazhang, which invites players to embody the role of a Chinese parent in raising a child with the goal of getting to them, them to excel at the intensely competitive college entrance exam. Another game um, translated in English as Working Animals with ESOP, Sutu the Fu Bao, was billed as a morality tale about the temptation to overwork employees. Portraying China's 996 culture of overwork, one gamer commented that the game was, quote, mentally exhausting, end quote. So such potentially non-fun game experiences can be really compelling sites for scholars who wish to investigate the transgressive potential of play. But I would still suggest that such games cannot help us address the larger problem of fun's erasure from Chinese games more broadly. So finally, to turn my attention to the last form of fun, what we call unproductive fun, um, we can, of course, look at um, Chinese proverbs that admonish in individuals to be wary of unproductive forms of leisure. Phrases such as uh, or to idle one's time in pleasure and or uh, petty pleasures sap ambition suggest that play or wan can be so engrossing or addicting that one loses the will to do anything else. And play in this sense uh, is not only unproductive, but also a barrier to future productivity. Now, official government language, and Rollinson notes, quote, devalues the leisure practices of common people by insisting that various kinds of plan are negative for society, end quote. And Rollinson um, refers in this regard to all sorts of activities that fall under the umbrella of Wang. Um, such as commonplace activities being idle, strolling about, enjoying oneself, playing around. Um, and this kind of wasteful fun can be distinguished from more productive forms of leisure or xiuxian. Um, but even those games depicted as productive and beneficial are then seen as harmful in excess, right? To go back to the example of Wei Qi, Mark Moskowitz notes that Confucian scholars um, worried that involvement in Wei Qi, quote, represented misplaced, misplaced talent, energy, and time, end quote. So <clears throat> the shift from productive leisure pursuits of the upper class to the unproductive um, fun enjoyed by common people may be partially captured by the term ruanao, or noisy and hot. Now, unlike words such as xiuxian and wan, which actually target the activity itself. The thing I like about now is that it refers instead to the effective dimensions of play and the emotional state that lifts from group activities. So this concept of now 
there's a close uh, resemblance to Emile Durkheim's classic sociological concept of collective effervescence. And ethnographers Adam Yuet Chow and Hans Steinmuller, Steinmuller uh, have suggested that Runauer's social heat is produced through all manner of common leisure activities from temple fairs to gambling. Now, in studying internet cafes and digital gaming activities that occur within them, scholars have approximated the concept of Ruanao through the discussion of the cafe's exciting atmosphere, Chi Fen. Um, similarly, many young people I interviewed told me that a game is not fun unless it's played with other people. Others recalled the joy of sightseeing or celebrating spring festival with friends in the context of the game. And in this sense, fun can emerge from the interaction of two players who in socializing in or around the space of the game, create this collective experience of fun. Thus we can have fun realized even when the game itself might be seen, might be deemed unproductive or boring. So if we return uh, to the concept of uh, grinding or gun, uh, this word I think is important because it shows us how fun is not necessarily the antithesis of labor and exhaustion. The, fun, the term can be interpreted both positively and negatively. A good game is so compelling uh, that gamers will stay up all night playing it, while a bad game requires the expenditure of time without delivering any reward. Games themselves have been subject to a similar double discursive construction. So again, this is something I look at in depth in my book, but while the media and government cast games as a harmful form of spiritual opium, um, gamers have explained their love of games by way of calling them a spiritual ho homeland, jingshen jiayuan, or spiritual spaces, jingshen kongjian. And, um, you know, there are obvious uh, depths to the phrase spiritual opium um, in Chinese history, which again, I explore in my book and I won't get into here. Um, but the use of this term jingshan jiayuan in this situation is very interesting um, juxtaposition to the claim that the games are spiritual opium. Similarly, um, in field work conducted with World of Warcraft gamers in Wuhan, Richard Hornbeck highlighted um, how gamers explained that there's a quote, spiritual encouragement in World of Warcraft that you can never get in reality, end quote. And this emphasis on games' capacity to cultivate effective dimensions of experience is an important and yet understudied aspect of Chinese digital gaming. Now, to consider something a spiritual homeland is somewhat ambiguous. There is, after all, both positive and negative affect associated with one's spirit. Um, gamers may use the space of the game to commiserate about failure and loss just as much as they may emphasize happier affects. But to have a space in which one is feel, uh, free to feel, open to the possibility of fun and simultaneously the possibility of boredom or overwork is critical. Just as Sarah Ahmed distinguishes between the possibility of happiness and the imperative to be happy, we can look for the fun of games in ways that are not prescribed. So is it possible, and here I, I end with some questions and hopefully provocations, is it possible to envision a space in which games are legitimate spaces of hope and possibility and not simply forms of cruel optimism? Must we reassess what we want games to be and with it discard old models of why they are fun? Embracing games that are no fun has been interpreted by Bonnie Ruber of one as one manner of creating space for gamers whose experiences have been marginalized by the mainstream insistent that games built upon normal, normative models are fun. But in the Chinese case, the inverse is true. Given the fact that Chinese games and gamers' experiences are so rarely depicted as fun, what could be gained from studies that further interrogate the fun of Chinese games? If games are played for fun in the face of a discourse that denies the possibility of fun, then I think we've hit upon something important. Under such circumstances, even unproductive fun then may be meaningful. Now, <clears throat> here I'm asking the same question. What impression does the denial 
of fun and act. So as scholars, I think we can resist the urge to reduce fun to a sort of static and universal definition, while still recognizing that this concept may be useful in correcting overly dichotomized and orientalizing depiction of play in Chinese games. Um, this, to recall Fickle's discussion of Huizinga and Kalwa, helps us understand how games have long been burdened by notions of what proper play should be. Now, in, in closing, let me consider a more contemporary example and return uh, to uh, Liu Mengfei's argument. Sorry, I'm off a moment with my slide here. Return to Liu Mengfei's argument that genuine gamers seek to do something within the game space, right? Liu actually then goes on to contrast genuine gamers with what she calls fake gamers or shu jia wan jia. Um, and she states, um, but the consumer oriented mobile games we are familiar with today cultivate a different type of gamer. What they are seeking is not at all what can I do, but rather what can I consume? What thing will bring me the most pleasurable emotional experience? Um, now, in Liu's interpretation, individuals who purchase experiences or success within a game, uh, sorry, keep go, go back here, and let me look at this a moment more. Um, in Liu's interpretation, individuals who purchase experiences or success within a game are undermining the proper fun of games. These gamers wish to reap the emotional reward with none of the effort. Instead of focusing on the process of play, fake gamers place too much emphasis on purchasing goods in order to feel a certain way. Now, this divide between doing and feeling actually perpetuates this trope of the passive media consumer. In this interpretation, um, this sort of uh, consuming goods within a game as a means of a, achieving an emotional experience is an invalid form of fun. Here, we may recall the critique of Genshin Impact, which despite being highly successful and a demonstrably fun game, is seen as having sacrificed the purity of the game experience for profit. That the dominant discourse surrounding video games in China doesn't capture the true range of human experience with games as a given, right? The useless sort of effective dimensions of fun are rendered inconsequential to the process of disciplining the modern subject. Um, but despite this absence, we must recognize that the potential for fun exists even when games are played for work. Surely there's been more than one gold farmer who's found the experience of stealing gold from unwitting victims in the United States to be fun. <laughs> Indeed, we might even conceive of such forms of game-based work as a form of productive or tr transgressive fun. Um, from the perspective of those who play games, however, fun, regardless of how it is categorized, is an experience that I would suggest is both empowering and liberating. And no matter what government entities, media outlets, concerned parents, or even stodgy academics such as myself might say about it, the experience of fun once realized cannot be taken away. From an academic perspective, game study scholars continue to grapple with our own desire to prove the utility of fun. So scholarship continues to reproduce this emphasis on the productive or transgressive possibilities of play. Our eagerness to prove games and gaming are more than just fun reproduces the societal stigma surrounding the concept. As John Sharp and David Thomas have stated, games researchers are embarrassed by the purposelessness of games. Um, this may be seen as unfortunate omission in a cultural context in which games are presumed um, to be fun. But in a situation in which the fun of games is being actively erased, as it, as it is within China, scholars' avoidance of fun may unfortunately become a form of complicity. The absence of academic writing about the fun of Chinese games and gamers further marginalizes, perhaps even symbolically annihilates, those communities we seek to support through our work. And while acknowledging that there are many ways in which gamers have been disciplined by an ideology of productivity, 
we must also make room for effective experiences that move beyond this paradigm. To do justice to video games and those who play them within China, we make, must make room for the possibility of fun. Thank you. Thank you.